Hey Optomancers, Treant Monk here. We are into our second last week of Treant Monk's Guide to Wizards, and we are just doing two more wizard builds. Today we are going to be doing our Necromancer build. This build I call the Grave Mage, and we're going to make it with a Kobold. And there is a reason for that that I will be going through in the build. Uh, now, this build is going to concentrate on creating undead. And one thing that's kind of special about this build is what happens at level 17 when we get access to 9th level spells. This is largely theoretical. Usually I'm worrying about things that are practical, practical optimization. But there's just something so neat we can do at 17th level. I know that my first video usually gets more views than my third part video, and I understand that because a lot of campaigns just don't go to those levels, so who cares how the builds work out at that level. But I encourage you to at least check out the level 17 you're going to see. You're going to see in the bottom corner here, I'm going to have the level numbers as we move up uh, to see what we can do at 17th level. But for now, what I want to do is I want to show you how to build a Necromancer from level 1. Necromancer is one of those subclasses that is not particularly loved amongst the wizard subclasses, mainly because the level 2 ability is pretty lackluster. Uh, and th that brings us in to everything really slow, and they really do rely on doing undead creatures. Uh, but we're going to do that then. If we're going to make a necromancer, we're going to make undead creatures. And that's what we're going to do today, so let's get started. <laughs> So here's our Grave Mage. I'm going to be using D&D Beyond as usual. If you want to see the final version of this build, there will be a link in the video description down below. These videos I cut into three parts. The first part is going to talk about uh, what we call Tier 1, which is from levels 1 through 4. The second part will cover from levels 5 through 10. And then the third part will cover from levels 11 through 20. There will be links to the other videos in the video description down below. There's going to be links to this video and those video descriptions so you can go back and forth easily. So I've turned off all the homebrew stuff and the campaign specific stuff. So going into race, we're going to use Kobold for this build. Kobold is not a common choice for wizard builds, and there's good reasons why. So as a Kobold, we're going to get a plus 2 to Dexterity and minus 2 to Strength. This is just worse than other races. Other races, of course, are pretty much all only getting bonuses, and they usually get bonuses to at least two ability scores. Uh, so not only are we now getting multiple ability bonuses, we're getting a penalty, and in addition to that, we're not getting a bonus to Intelligence. So for good reason right off the bat, Kobold's not the obvious choice for a wizard. Kobolds are small size. This, of course, limits the effectiveness of spells like Thunderstep and Dimension Door, because those spells, if we're going to bring someone with us, they cannot be larger than us. So, assuming the rest of our party is medium-sized, uh, being small size is a disadvantage. But I will note that despite being small size, Kobolds don't suffer a movement penalty. They still have a movement of 30 feet. Dark Vision, very common ability for races to have, and Kobolds have it as well. However, unlike other creatures that have 60 foot dark vision, uh, Kobold has sunlight sensitivity as well. You have disadvantage on attack rolls and wisdom perception checks that rely on sight when you, the target of your attack, or whatever you're trying to perceive is in direct sunlight. Uh, this can be debilitating to a character that is going to rely on attack rolls a lot. Fortunately, with a caster, uh, we're going to have spells that will require attack rolls. Usually, those are our cantrips. Uh, we'll be using a light crossbow that will also require an attack roll. But we're going to have spell options as well that don't provide attack rolls. So we can work around some light sensitivity a lot better than most other classes can. On the other hand, we have pack tactics. You have advantage on an attack roll against a creature if at least one of your allies is within five feet of the creature and the ally isn't incapacitated. So now this includes both our party members. This would also include any undead creations we make or even our familiar. So there's lots of ways we can bring our pack tactics to bear so we can get advantage on attacks pretty regularly with this character. And finally, we get Grovel, Cower, and Beg. As an action on your turn, you can cower pathetically to distract nearby foes. Until the end of your next turn, your allies gain advantage on attack rolls against enemies within 10 feet of you that can see you. Once you use this trait, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Uh, so, number one, if we are concentrating on a spell already, then we can use this at, with our action uh, to give all our allies advantage. So that's going to help all the other PCs but also, and this is vital importance for this character, this is also going to help all our undead allies that we've raised. 
So this really is the reason I'm choosing Cobalt here, is because if we can get enough undead creatures, and we can give them all advantage on their attack rolls, that can be a huge offensive boost. Now that's going to require us to be within 10 feet of our enemies. Sometimes that's not a problem, sometimes that's going to require some planning, and it's something we need to think about uh, when we get to those levels where we're going to have several undead allies. So we'll take the wizard class. With this character, I'm going to take Arcana, which is kind of a standard for wizards. Uh, and then the second one I'm going to take, let's take Investigation. Uh, it relies on our intelligence. We'll have a pretty good intelligence, so that's going to work well for us. Going into our ability scores, I'm going to use a point by here. So we're really going to center in on a few abilities with this particular wizard build. Uh, our dexterity, we get a plus two, so let's take advantage of that. So we're going to go with a 14. It's going to give us a 16 starting dexterity. Then we're going to go to our constitution, and we're going to bump that one to a 15. And what we're going to do is we're going to grab the resilient uh, feat as soon as we can. That'll bump it to a 16 and boost our concentration saves. Uh, that gives us 11 points remaining. So we're going to go with our intelligence, get it up to a 14, uh, and that's about as good as we're going to get is a plus two bonus uh, with our intelligence at first level uh, and then with our wisdom we're going to bump that up to a 12. We're going to leave our charisma at eight. Our strength is going to be absolutely abysmal. When it comes to background I really think that we're a kobold. I like the idea of an urchin for a kobold uh, so that's what I'm going to take. Now if you want perception for your character then take a different background or switch one of the skills that urchin gives you to perception. Uh, the player's handbook does allow for this to happen. Uh, but for me, I'm just going to keep it the same here. We'll keep our sleight of hand and stealth. So this particular character does not have the perception skill. From an optimization standpoint, generally I recommend the perception skill. Uh, and with this character, no different. This is purely thematic for me. Taking Urchin here, it's, it's a bit of a guilty pleasure because I just see that to fit with Kobold nicely. Maybe this Urchin was just wandering around one day and they came to a dead body in an alley and that body had a spell book and then the kobold learned to cast spells from the spell book and became a wizard from there. Then we're going to do just standard starting equipment is fine. So we're going to grab a dagger, uh, we'll grab a component pouch, we'll grab an explorer's pack and of course we have our spell book and our urchin stuff. Now what I'm going to add here is that we do not start with a ranged weapon. Because we have a really good dexterity and our intelligence isn't as good, I think that getting a light crossbow at this level is huge. Uh, now if you can't get a light crossbow, you can buy a sling, you have enough money for it, that's still going to be better than any cantrip you can use. Uh, but if you can get a light crossbow, or as soon as you can get a light crossbow, that's going to be your better option. Certainly until we get to fifth level, a uh, crossbow or even a sling is going to be a better option than a cantrip when we need to do an attack in combat. So we're going to pick three cantrips at first level. Uh, so the first cantrip I'm going to take, surprise, surprise, is Minor Illusion. Uh, second cantrip I'm going to take, I want to take another good cantrip that has utility value. So let's grab Mage Hand. Uh, and then I definitely want an attack cantrip. And I think the attack cantrip that is obvious here is Toll the Dead. Uh, because when we do our crossbow attack or our sling attack, if we don't have a crossbow yet, we're going to be making an attack roll. Uh, so Toll the Dead gives us an option that doesn't use an attack roll. And the fact that it's necromancy actually makes no difference. Even though we're going to become a necromancer, we'll never really get a bonus with that. Uh, but Toll the Dead is a strong offensive spell. Does D8 damage, but D12 if the opponent is already damaged, which we can usually take advantage of. So in terms of damage, it does as much damage as any other cantrip. Uh, range of 60 feet. Also, we're not going to have a good melee attack. Toll the Dead gives us an option if we get stuck in melee. Then we're going to pick six level one spells. Uh, and the first one I'm going to take is Shield uh, to jump our defense. Uh, then I'm going to grab Mage Armor. Again, this character is not going to multi-class, so we're not going to be wearing armor. So Mage Armor is pretty important for this character. Uh, then we want a big gun spell, and I'm going to go back to the good old Sleep, which is when I'm multi-classing into Wizard from another class, uh, so we're starting at second level, Sleep is less attractive because Sleep, of course, devalues very quickly. But at first level, it's huge. So if I'm going straight wizard, going with sleep at first level makes a lot of sense. Now we're only going to be able to prepare three spells, so let's go ahead and take three rituals. Uh, first one I'm going to take is find familiar, of course. Uh, the second one I'm going to take is detect magic. Again, a really strong ritual to have. And the third one I'm going to take is comprehend languages. Definitely something can come in handy. 
So we'll just prepare the three spells that we might actually cast without using a ritual. Mage Armor, Shield, and Sleep. Now, in terms of tactics, I probably would not cast Mage Armor. Because you only have two spells at first level. You get one back after a short rest. That's three spells on the standard adventuring day. Uh, if we don't cast Mage Armor and we just try to stay out of melee, there's a good chance we won't be attacked in most combats. Uh, and if we aren't attacked, then we can use the Sleep spell to huge effect. Uh, but if we do get attacked, we can always rely on that Shield spell to boost our defense. is isn't necessarily going to turn attacks into a miss, uh, but it gives a reasonable chance. And there's a decent chance we won't need to cast Mage Armor or Shield. So let's take that gamble. I think we're better off uh, holding off on that Mage Armor. But if we do get a light crossbow, we have a pretty good attack. That's a plus 5 to hit for d8 plus 3 damage. Remember, we have sunlight sensitivity, so we're going to want to try to stay out of bright sunlight. Uh, and we do have our pack tactics, so we can often get advantage on this. So if we can get advantage on this, this is actually probably going to be better than most other characters can do uh, with their attack. Of course, we can get advantage with the familiar as well, but pack tactics doesn't require putting our familiar in danger. Another thing I'll mention about find familiar is uh, when we look at the forms, seems to me that a bat makes a lot of sense for a necromancer. Unfortunately, there's no undead forms, but I might consider asking my DM whether an undead form would be possible, uh, just because I think it would be thematically appropriate for this character. So we're going to go into level two. This is where we become a necromancer, but I gotta say that I don't think we really become a necromancer until level six. Uh, I'd say from levels one through five, this is a wizard. And at level six is when we really start to feel like a necromancer. Uh, because that level two ability doesn't do much, but that level six ability does do a lot. So if you want to see this character really as a necromancer, maybe even skip this first part and go right to the second video. But on a level by level basis, let's go to level two and see what we would do. So now we are officially a necromancer. So now at second level, we will pick the arcane tradition necromancy. And what it's going to give us is Grim Harvest. At second level, you gain the ability to reap energy from creatures you kill with your spells. Once per turn, when you kill one or more creatures with a spell of first level or higher, you regain hit points equal to twice the spell's level, or three times its level if it belongs to the school of necromancy. You don't gain this benefit for killing constructs or undead. So there's two problems with this ability. The first one is it's recovering hit points. So if you're not damaged, it does nothing. I would prefer if it did something like temporary hit points, uh, but it's only going to help you if you are damaged. The second thing is that it does that additional healing if it, it's a necromancy school, and that would kind of push us towards necromancy spells that did damage. But although there are a number of good necromancy spells in the game, very few of them actually are good at doing damage. Doing damage tends to be spells that are like from the evocation school. Uh, necromancy spells in general are just weaker than those when they're just about doing damage. So this is a bit of a trap because it's not a great ability to begin with. We can recover our hit points anyways with those other spells. So this isn't going to have a huge impact on my spell selection. That said, in order to take advantage of this ability at all, we are going to want some spells that do damage. So we're going to start looking at that as we go up in levels. Because just because Grim Harvest doesn't work particularly well for necromancy spells doesn't mean it's a useless ability. It's still useful to be able to regain hit points by killing creatures with your spells, but I wouldn't feel overly compelled to stick to necromancy spells. And speaking of that, at first level, you don't even have any necromancy spells that do damage, except a cantrip. And a cantrip, of course, doesn't benefit from Grim Harvest because you double the level of a zero level spell and you're healing zero hit points. So we can't make use of that ability with a necromancy spell right now, even if we wanted to. Honestly, at second level, I'm not going to worry too much about Grim Harvest. I'm just going to take two first level spells that I think are good, one that I'm going to prepare, one that I'm not. So the one I'm going to prepare is Absorb Elements. This usually ends up on my spell list at some point. It's not something that I'm going to use a lot at second level, but as I go up in level, it becomes more and more valuable. And then I'm going to take a ritual because I can only prepare one more spell. Uh, so let's take a useful ritual for a character with a really low strength. So let's take Tensor's Floating Disc because our character has a six strength. We can carry very, very little, but we can use a ritual to give us a floating disc that can carry our stuff for us. Uh, and that's the way it should be with a wizard. Wizards not relying on their strength, they're relying on their spells. So we're going to be able to do that using a ritual spell so it's not going to use any spell slots. 
Otherwise, very little change from first level. Uh, we're still using sleep in combat. Uh, we're still using our crossbow in combat, except we're going to have one additional spell. And because we have that one additional spell, this is when I'd be inclined to cast Mage Armor right away. Because our armor class is only 13, but once we put a Mage Armor on there, it's a 16. And then we can potentially boost that to a 21 with our Shield spell. But that base 16 means that a lot of attacks are going to miss us without using a Shield spell. Uh, so that is going to be probably worth that spell slot now. So going to level 3 is going to get us access to their second level spells. Now sleep is becoming less effective at this point, but we still want a good big gun spell. Uh, and so this is a great chance for us to pick up web. Uh, and web and necromancy for me go together, the idea of spiders going around tombs and stuff like that. Uh, so I think it's thematically appropriate. And web is by far your best area of effect when we're looking at second level spells. And then we're going to grab Misty Step for the maneuverability options it provides. So the spell book really easy here. We're just going to get Misty Step and Web and we'll prepare them both. For now we'll keep Sleep prepared at third level. Again it's losing its potency but there's still sometimes it's useful uh, and we don't need that preparation slot for anything else right now. Now one thing that does happen at third level is we have a lot more spells because at second level we have three spells per day plus another one through Arcane Recovery. Now we've gone to six spells a day with another two with Arcane Recovery so that's eight spells a day. Of course some of them are second level spells. So Mage Armor is no question now. We're definitely throwing on our Mage Armor. We're definitely using our Shield if we get hit. Um, and then we will use our Sleep for those cases where we see minions or things that we don't think have a lot of hit points that we could do a lot of effect with a Sleep spell. Uh, and then we're going to use our Web for those more important combats or those tougher enemies that we want to control. So we're just going to zip along to fourth level here. These first few levels are going to move fairly quickly here because we're not doing a lot of unique things with this build again until we get to level six. But we get our first ability score improvement and we're not going to increase our intelligence yet. We do need to shore up our concentration saves, although undead and maintaining undead isn't going to require our concentration. We have other spells that are going to require our concentration. We already have web, which requires concentration, and there will be more. Uh, so I do think it's worthwhile to go ahead and get resilient constitution right now. It's going to get our constitution to 16. That's really good for a wizard constitution. Uh, and then we're going to have proficiency on top of that, which is going to help those concentration saves. And then we're going to grab an additional cantrip at this level. Uh, now, at this point, we're getting close to fifth level. Uh, this is the point where cantrips are going to scale, so now I might want to consider getting an attack cantrip that can replace that crossbow attack. Uh, so let's pick up Ray of Frost. Now we could grab Chill Touch here, but Chill Touch does necrotic damage. That's the same kind of damage as our Toll of the Dead, and we don't want to get constrained to one kind of damage in case we come up against immunity. Now Firebolt would be a perfectly reasonable option here. Uh, so it's Ray of Frost or Firebolt. I'm going to go with Ray of Frost here. It's going to give us D8 damage and then the ability to slow our enemies if we hit them. Then we're going to get two more second level spells. The first one I'm going to grab is Mirror Image. This is just a way to layer up our defenses. Mirror Image, of course, does not use concentration. Can turn attacks on us into automatic misses up to three times. So this is a spell that I tend to throw on most of my wizard builds. Uh, I'm going to take one that I normally don't take, uh, but I do think it's a reasonable spell and that's Pyrotechnics. This is something I'm not going to use a lot yet, uh, but it's definitely something I can consider using later on. Uh, so pyrotechnics, number one, it does not require concentration. This is important because it means we can do this at the same time while we're concentrating on another spell. We choose an area of non-magical flame that you can see and fits within a five foot cube within range. The ra that range is 60 feet. You can extinguish the fire in that area and you can create either fireworks or smoke when you do so. So the fireworks, the target explodes with a dazzling display of colors. Each creature within 10 feet of the target must succeed on a constitution saving throw or become blinded until the end of our next turn. So it's just a short duration blindness effect, um, area of effect, no concentration. The other is smoke. Black smoke spreads out from the target in a 20 foot radius. So that's like a fog cloud moving around corners. The area of smoke is heavily obscured. The smoke persists for one minute or until a strong wind disperses it. So again, this is a fog cloud with no concentration. Uh, so why do I want this on my list? Well, because I'm eventually going to have undead servants. Giving that zombie a torch is no problem at all. We can move it to where we want to move it and then use a pyrotechnics on it. Now it's not really important that we prepare pyrotechnics yet, but we might as well, because sleep 
by this level is just not cutting it anymore. So there's no point in us continuing to prepare sleep. So that does give us two preparation slots open. So let's prepare both pyrotechnics and mirror image for now. So with our boost to constitution, our hit points have increased significantly. We're at 30 hit points at fourth level. That's not bad at all. Uh, and we have a constitution saving throw of plus five, and that's going to be going up very soon. So that's a reasonably good constitution saving throw. Uh, now we don't have advantage as some other wizards do, uh, but because we have a strong base, we're still gonna make our concentration save most of the time. At fourth level, crossbow is still our best attack. Just because we picked up Ray of Frost doesn't mean I'd be switching yet. But next level, we might want to consider it because we're going to be increasing our damage to 2d8 with that Ray of Frost, uh, which is going to be doing more damage if we hit. And remember, we can often get advantage. But in combat, still pretty much the same tactics we saw at third level. So that's this character to level four. That was pretty quick uh, because again, right now we're just a standard wizard and we're not really getting anything special yet. We're going to see this character really start to feel like a necromancer in our next video when we get to level six. So you will find links to that video in the video description or the comment section down below. Uh, so I hope to see you soon. Mm -hmm.